Hey everyone, welcome to Clarification Regex Weaponry. We're going to talk about a lot of regular expression stuff today, kind of for beginners. So I am Claire Merriman. I work at Splunk in the IT organization. Uh, we run Splunk for internal customers. Carrie, did you want to say hi? Hi everyone. This, I'm Carrie, and I work at Stage 2 Security, and I'm working for Adobe right now. So as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about regular expressions today. Part of that is we're going to explain what is regular expressions. For those of you who might not know, we'll kind of get into some of the commands that Splunk has and the options available, as well as uh, this really cool field extraction tool. So regex stands for regular expressions. It matches patterns within the text so that you can use it for extracting fields or for modifying your data, masking PII data, things like that. It's a really powerful tool. So Carrie, can you help us understand a little bit more about it? Sure, thanks, Clara. So as many of you know, I love regular expressions. Regex is one of the most basic building blocks you have for use with Splunk. You can use it directly with your SPL when you're searching or index time before data ever gets to where you can search it. They both have advantages and disadvantages. But regular expressions are available to you throughout Splunk. Now, the search time functions that are there are ones that you will only use within SPL. The index time ones can make a difference on search time as well as at index time. But the index time functions are, are very powerful for making sure that your data comes in properly. So, for example, with regex functions in SPL, you have RECs, which can do both extractions of fields, and it can also replace strings. So if you are trying to make a field out of the data that's coming in on, on an event, you can extract those fields using RECs. And also, if you are going to replace some string that's within that, RECs is powerful for doing the field extractions mostly. But then there's also regex. With regex, you can extend the capabilities of regular expressions in your searches. The searches, you have strings that you can supply in your search that you'll look for, but it's not as powerful as a regular expression. What you need to do is pipe that into the regex command to actually go ahead and use a regular expression to filter out those events. Erex is not my favorite of the regular expression search time functions. It kind of muddles things up for some people, but if you don't know too much about regular expressions, Erex can help you. But hopefully after learning some more with this regex presentation, you won't ever have to use Erex ever again. Now, match is uh, usually used in conditionals. Uh, so for example, you're doing an eval and you say eval x equals if, and then you might have a field that you're trying to uh, match some part of it with a regular expression. Then you can use match with that regular expression and be able to use that conditional more powerfully. MV find, you're, what you're going to do is have a value that you're going to pull out of a multi-value field. And you'll give your regular expression, pass it into MV find with the field that has multiple values. And what will happen is it will re return the index of that multi-value field that, has, that matches that uh, regular expression. And replace is kind of like the Rex search and replace uh, type capability, but it's a different syntax. So you're really going to be doing it a, a similar way, but it's something that you can do at a different level, right within an eval expression, for instance. Now our magnificent um, all-knowing Clara will explain some of the ways that you can use regular expressions at index time. Thanks, Carrie, for that really nice introduction. As you all know, though, Carrie is the regex guru and he has taught me everything I know, I'm sure of it. So to hop in to the index time stuff, let's quickly go over the props.comp side of it. So there are a lot of options within props.comp for regular expressions. The said CMD command is one of them, and it uses regular expressions to replace or to modify the raw events. 
This can be really helpful to mask uh, PII or any other type of data. Another option is when you might want to break up raw events. You're getting a really large chunk, but it needs to be multiple events. A line breaker is really helpful. It matches the pattern in the data to start a new event afterwards. And then lastly, the only other one I'm going to talk about right now is a time prefix, which lets you look at where a timestamp is and extract it there. You might have a timestamp in the middle of your event and the end of your event. And the time prefix will let you use regular expressions to find where it's starting so that you can extract it from there. As I mentioned, there are a lot of options for props.com and they all have their own purpose. We do have some documentation in our resources. So make sure you check that out later. So what is props.com without transforms? In transforms.com, there are a few options that use regular expressions. Most notably, this would be the regex and the format options. Regex is kind of used for really simple field extractions, similar to how you would use rex in the search bar, but it can also be used in conjunction with format to specify key value pairs and some more complicated type of extractions. And again, to learn more about these, just check out the documentation. They've got some really great examples for this. So let's dive a little bit deeper into how to use regular expressions. There are so many arguments and that's what makes this a really flexible tool. We can use tokens to match the different types of data, such as characters and digits and words. We can use anchors to define the boundaries. So we might want a word boundary or we might want to see the start of the string, the end of the string. Quantifiers are similar to what it sounds like. They'll match the number of occurrences of that pattern. So if you have three digits in a row and you want to only match three digits, you can use the quantifier of three attached to the digit token to make that uh, match there. Groups are used to create new fields. They're used to group patterns together that you can potentially use for substitution, which is used obviously for substituting strings or characters. Substitution is super powerful. We'll get into that a little bit more later. Lastly, we have the character classes, which can be used in groups to match other words or patterns and and define what you're actually looking for. Um, so now that we kind of have an idea of the different types of arguments and regular expressions, I'm going to pass it back to Carrie to explain some of these in a little bit more detail. Thanks, Clara. So here we go. This is some fun syntax. If you have to find a word character, use backslash W. That would be alphanumerics and underscore. Other characters can be found using a black backslash capital W, which means the things that are not alphanumerics and underscores. So they are opposites and complement each other. The same is true with the backslash S and the backslash capital S. White space or non-white space characters. In fact, one of the things that um, I use quite often when I want to match any character at all is a character class, which is down at the bottom of this list, but you use a backslash S, backslash capital S, which will match either a, a space or a non-space, which basically got, will match everything. So uh, now there's going to be a quiz at the end of this, so be careful. Got to make sure you understand. Now, there's D and uh, capital D with the backslash in front of it. And that is going to be for digits, zero through nine. And that's not one through zero, that's zero through nine. So then we come to the Bs. The B is, stands for a word boundary. Now, word boundary um, is going to be uh, like the beginning of a word or the end of a word. And the non-word boundary is going to be something that's in the middle of a word. We'll talk about that more a little bit later. Then there are character sets. So for example, if you want to match the digits one through five only, you would do one dash five in between the square brackets. I'll show you more of this in our example and in the demo, but the hat character that would be used at the beginning, just after the square bracket, is to denote that you're going to not match those characters that are found within the brackets. And you can have lists of the characters that you want to match. So if you wanted to match one, three, seven, and nine only, you could match uh, you would put one, three, seven, and nine inside the square brackets, and it would match only those characters. So it gives you a very powerful way to um, give the exact match of the characters that you want. Now, quantifiers. These are things that tell how many of the 
an item that you want. The first quantifiers that we're going to talk about are around being greedy or lazy. Now, star means zero or more of the item preceding it, and a plus means one or more of the items preceding it. So if you have a single character preceding it, it like an X, if you have a, an asterisk, it would, could match zero Xs up to a million Xs. Uh, a plus would match at least one X. And there's a, a difference there, and it, it makes it um, helpful when you're trying to be able to make something be zero or more. Plus meaning I've got to have at least one of these. Then the lazy match is where you put a question mark after the asterisk or the plus, which means I don't want to do as many as possible. What I want to do is do as many as possible up to the first match. Now let's look at the numerical matches where your quantifier matches where you're saying you want to match a specific number of times. Curly braces are used to give the command for how many you want to find. If you have just one number, that will be the exact number that you specify in there of the item preceding it. If you put two numeric values in there, separated by a comma, then that will say at least n, but no more than m. So if you wanted to do two, three, or four of the preceding item, you would do two comma four inside the curly braces. Now, the last one here is the inspecific item. If you have a question mark that follows some character class, something that you're, you may want to just have as optional, you put a question mark after it. Okay, now, the other interesting things here are start of a string and end of a string. There are two different ways of doing end and start. Start can be either a hat or caret symbol um, or a backslash capital A. The end of a string can be denoted with a dollar sign or a backslash capital Z. So if you wanted to anchor your search at the beginning and only look at the beginning of the string, where you're going to match your, your characters in your regular expression, then you're going to do a hat, caret, character at the beginning of your regular expression. And then the things that follow it are going to be those things that you want to match. But it's saying start at the beginning. Or maybe you're saying, I want to find this string only at the end of my set of characters in this event. So then you would put the dollar sign at the end of your string denoting that you want to match everything right up to the end of your string in the event or in the field. Now, we've already talked about greedy and lazy matches, but uh, hopefully this will make it a little bit more understandable. In this example, we've got Clara and Carrie both in quotes. If I were to use a dot star asterisk uh, within the quotes or dot plus within the quotes, then it would match all of Clara and Carrie. But if I wanted to get either Clara or Carrie, I would want to use a lazy match, which would put the question mark after the asterisk. That will make it be um, match only up to the first um, double quote that I have there. That makes it be lazy because it, it doesn't want to go any further, right? It's going to do the minimum amount of work. So that question mark can be helpful when you've got a list that has Clara and Carrie like that, and you want to separate those out. And now we've got named fields. Named fields are taking some part of your event and putting that into a field name. And you may have text at the beginning, the pre-regex, then your regex to find the thing that you want to put in your field extraction name variable. And then you might have some post regex text after that. You don't have to. You can even have uh, another um, named field extraction before it. It doesn't matter. It's just that you're going to be naming some part of it. Like for instance, here it says teachers. Teachers are Clara and Carrie. So you want to get Clara and Carrie in a field called teachers. So this is looking for the pre-regex string of digits and then a space 
And then we're going to look at three word sections. So there's three words. So uh, word, space, space, word, space. Uh, and then that last space is optional because it has a question mark there. But this is not a lazy match, it's a greedy match. So it's going to take those full Clara and Carrie words and put them into a field called teachers. And then space, amaze, and everything else comes afterward. Okay, now Clara has some more great examples for you. Take it away, Clara. So I love all of these examples so far. Uh, the next example I have is kind of a spinoff of the last example. Here we have the same message as the previous example, but in this first bullet here, what you can see, I'm not actually naming any fields right now. I just want to kind of show you some different ways that you can group fields together for pattern matching. So in red here, I have uh, my timestamp matched. I'm using backslash D for some quantifiers. The pipe in both of there's both of those first two groups have a pipe that's telling me look for this or that. So I'm looking for digits or dashes. I'm looking for digits or colons. I've got that T in the middle there because I want to actually match the T character that's in my timestamp. That's how I'm matching the timestamp in red. You can see at the end, I have a greedy quantifier in orange, and that's just going to match everything after the space after the timestamp there. If we wanted to put this in two fields itself, the second bullet kind of goes over that. So I have timestamp in the little carrots there to tell me that's the field I want to call it. And then I'm matching everything up to that first space. And that's what's going into my timestamp field. The, the end part there is, again, just being very greedy, just grabbing everything to the end of the event to put into my message field. So now I just really wanna go over some replacement stuff. This is gonna be a little bit more detailed in the actual demo that's coming up, but basically the rex command is used at search time to run replacements. Mode equals said is the option that you use for this. If you're curious, said stands for stream editor. This needs to be inside quotes to, to tell the command what you're actually doing there. You can use some, some different things here. So in my example, I'm using the S command and that is for a string replacement, but you can use the Y command for a character replacement. Flags at the end, I have G here. G is for global, but you can also identify a number and that indicates the location in the string that you're looking to match. There is a similar eval function called replace. Carrie talked about it earlier that can be used instead of this. They're very similar, but they do work a little bit differently. So you can go check out some documentation on that. Uh, replacing text is really beneficial. For example, you might want to remove the domain from an email address just so you have a username and that's, this can help with that. So I want to dig a little bit deeper into replacements. Uh, and here you can actually keep a matched group and replace other things as well. So in this example, We've created two groups. The first group matches everything up until it sees the second group, which matches rock at regex. In my replacement section of the command, we're replacing the string with I and adding the second matched group to create the string I rock at regex instead of carrying Clara rock at regex. This can be really helpful, as you can imagine, when you only want to keep part of a string and you want to replace or remove everything else. So Carrie, can you help us out with a few more of these examples? I'd be happy to, Clara. Thanks so much. Now, this is an example um, that's important to understand how delimiting things works. For example, this value that's in double quotes. What we want to do is we want to capture everything that's within the double quotes, but we don't want to necessarily go beyond that double quote, just the things that are inside. So we're going to search for things that are not a double quote and extract all of those. So our regular expression is double quote and then the parentheses for the named value. Then the regular expression is actually going for finding that is going to be everything that is not a double quote followed by afterward a double quote. So that's going to get everything that is within the double quotes but not go beyond. This can be done in many different ways. If you have single quotes, if you've got it delimited by any other character that you want, commas or anything else. That second set that says delimited lists. Let's say you have a list of things like first, second, third that I have there. 
you want to separate those into three different fields. So you have them named one, two, and three. Well, you're going to, instead of uh, trying to find out what might be in there, because you could have spaces, you could have all kinds of things that are in there. You want to say, I want to have everything that's matched that's not a comma as the first named field. And then the second named field, the same thing, everything up to the next comma. And the third one, everything up to the last comma or nothing at all. If, there, if it doesn't have a comma at the end, you can still have anything that's not a comma and it'll still find everything that wasn't there that, or that was there that was not a comma. So it all works out. But this is important to understand for the way you're going to get at things that are lists or delimited values. Okay, now this is a simple example of extracting an IP address. So in our example 10.0.0.1, what we want to do in this case is just look for a bunch of digits followed by a period, followed by a bunch of digits, followed by a period, followed by a bunch of digits. So we're going to use the enumerated field uh, of the curly braces with a number in it to say we want three of the thing that's parentheses in, in, within parentheses just before it. Okay, now our final example here, it, this is useful for matching a URL. You could have a question mark after the S in HTTPS, and it would match either HTTP or HTTPS. That allows you to add the S at the end without making it mandatory. Then we're going to have that full first um, expression of uh, this within the parentheses of HTTPS colon slash slash. Then that is a whole optional item. You don't have to have that in this example, but it is something that would match if it were there. Then www dot is another thing in parentheses, and it has a question mark after it, so it's going to be optional as well. Then the things that are not optional will be the domain name and the top level domain. So those are the two things. It wouldn't match a more complicated domain name that might have more dots in it. And then finally the TLD at the end, but it will do just a domain and TLD giving you a, a basic uh, URL extraction. And within that extraction, you've got A through Z, zero through nine. Now you may also want to do uh, capitals so you could have capital A through Z, little a through Z, zero through nine. It depends on how it would match with your data. You may want to only match those that are lowercase. So it gives you that option of finding which ones you want that way. And then the backslash dot is important to have there uh, because the dot will match any character. So the backslash says, I want you to match exactly one period. And that's it. So that's going to have like uh, Splunk.com would be found this way because Splunk.com would match the regular expression. You could have HTTPS colon slash slash www.splunk.com and that would match as well. So you're giving yourself enough difference in how that URL could come in but also making it specific to how it should come in and, and be designated. Okay, now I'll turn over turn the time over to Clara for a demo of using regular expressions within SPL. All right, let's do some demos. I'm just going to use some make results really quick so we have some data in here. And then the first thing that I want to do is I want to do some field extractions to see fields in my data. And so what you can see here is that I'm using the rex command, which is going to help me with field extractions. I'm doing this on the data field. And this first section here, you can see I've got the parentheses followed by a question mark caret, and that's gonna help me define my field name. So I'm going to name this first field IP address, and then I'm using this uh, character class here to look for the first space, uh, which you can see right there right after the IP, and I'm gonna grab all the stuff up until that first space. Then I'm gonna ignore the space because I don't need it in a field. I'm going to create an email field. I'm going to look for the same thing. I just want that space because emails aren't going to have a space in it. 
and then I'm going to ignore that space and then I'm going to look for a bracket uh, because all of those timestamps are enclosed inside brackets. So I'm going to create a timestamp field and I'm going to look for the first closed bracket uh, so that I can get everything in between the open and closed bracket uh, for my timestamp field. And then I'm going to ignore that closed bracket and the next space because I don't need that in a field. This next section in parentheses is going to group together a dash and a space. Uh, the question mark behind this group is to kind of make that optional. You can see in my first couple of events, it's just the bracket space. And then the last event though is a, is a dash involved in there. So I, want, I don't want to include that dash. Uh, when I create this message field. And the message field is just going to grab everything after the timestamp uh, to the end of the event. So as you can see here, after running this, we have an IP address extracted, an email extracted, the timestamp, not including those brackets, is extracted, and then my message field, which is everything at the end. If I were to take out that dash uh, space question mark, you can see that the dash is included in the message. And so we want to make sure we uh, don't look for those because we, we don't want them in the message. The next section I'm going to do, I'm going to do a replacement. Uh, this is also using Rex. I'm looking at the message field and I'm doing mode equals said, which is the replacement command. In here, I'm going to look for anything that says Clara in that message field and I'm going to replace it with Carrie. So when we run this, you can see that first message now says Carrie, where it did originally say Clara. To take this a little step further, I'm going to do another replacement command. However, I'm going to look uh, for some different things. So I'm, I'm looking at message, I'm putting mode equals set again. I'm going to look for a word boundary this time for regular expressions or, which is the pipe, uh, regex. So I want to match um, either one of those. Uh, and you can see I've got regex and regular expressions that both exist. I want to replace them with B sides 22. So when I run that, now I've got a message that says Carrie runs a demo for B sides 22. And Carrie is a B sides 22 guru. All true, of course. Uh, but you can see in the original text, it did have regular expressions and regex. Uh, the next thing I want to do here is I want to show you how the match function works. So match is a function of the eval command uh, and it's it's used in if statements or case statements. So what I'm doing here is I want to match any IP address that starts with a digit of two or three in length and then followed by a period. If anything matches that I want to name it IPv4 otherwise I'm going to put in the label IPv6. So when I run this you can see in this bottom area I do have IPv4 for the first two and clearly IPv6 is the last one. If I were to get rid of that dot though at the end, all of them match IPv4 because the last IP address does start with two or three digits and is not followed by a period, right? And so we want to make sure we have that period in there uh, to make that distinction for this. Uh, so I also want to show you really quickly the regex command, which is super cool. It's essentially like a search command. So it will filter um, for uh, regular expressions. So I'm using the email field and I want to look for any email that has Yahoo. Uh, so we, it filters out those other two events because this is the only one we care about. You can also do not equals and now I get the other two because I don't want to see anything that came from Yahoo. Finally, I'm going to go over the erex command. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a raw field because erex uses the raw event. I'm giving it a field of time. That's what I want it to extract to. And then you add in your examples. So I put in just a regular date uh, that I took from the event to give it an example of what my time fields actually look like. So you can see here that when I run the command, I have a time field that's extracted now and it matches my timestamp field. It's a really easy way to extract fields um, just by giving examples and not actually writing regular expressions.
But what's even better is that if you look at the job inspector, you can actually see that it has written Rex command for you. So if I go and I paste that Rex command in here and then I get rid of the Erex command I ran earlier, I still have that time field. It still matches that timestamp field. And we just hacked our way through regular expressions. Demo of the field extraction tool in Splunk. Once you have the search that you want and the data that you want to extract fields from, you'll want to go over and select in this area and then go to Event Actions, Extract Fields. This is that event that we want to extract fields from. Go to Regular Expression, click Next, and here is our event. We're going to look at the user ID. So double click it. I'm going to say it's the user. Add the extraction. And now, as you can see, those are in here. If I want to change the regular expression, first I need to show the regular expression and then edit the regular expression. Let's make a small change to this. And we're just going to say dot star at the beginning. And let's preview that. And it sh shows up the same ones. If there are things that don't match, then it'll have things that don't match in this non-matches. Of course, everything obviously matched. You can see the events that matched only, or you can see all the events, and the ones that don't match will not have a green check here. They'll have a red X. Let's add something to this regular expression. So we're going to add a space, and then we're going to extract the port. And that's just a backslash D plus. I'm going to preview that. And now we have the port number. You can add anything in here that will match the fields that you want. And then you're ready to go. Then you can save. And since this is an extraction of user and port, it's going to have the extraction name named extract dash user port. This I'm the owner with the search. You can have it. Uh, just for you in the app, or in the case of an administrator, you can do it for all apps. The source type is access combined. This is from the search that it got, and these are the two fields that we specified in our regular expression. And this is the regular expression, and you can just finish it, and you're ready to go. Okay, this is a quick tutorial of Regex 101. Over here, we have a flavor of regular expression, whether you want to do PCRE or Python or Java, you can select that. You can also do selecting of either just matching, which will match throughout all of the data that you're going to have in your test string area, or if you want to do substitution, it will allow you to do substitutions by putting your substitution string for anything that's matched up here. Over here we have an explanation of anything that you put in your regular expression. So as you can see, as you go along here, you get an explanation. But also, over here, there's a, an explanation of everything. Here you can change the delimiter so that you don't have to necessarily escape the delimiter that might be in your regular expression here. The test string area, you can have many strings in here if you want, or just one or two. It's up to you. The match information over here will show what was matched by the regular expression. And if you have multiple matches for different things, it will show each of those matches here. And then there's a quick reference where you can get additional information like all tokens, common tokens, anchors, and so forth. There is explanation of those. And if you want a more detail, you can select the one and it will give you close details. And then you can close that out and go back and do another one. This is a quick look at lazy versus greedy matches. This is a greedy match up here and it's going from one double quote all the way up to the last double quote which is what we get out of this match in the string. If we change that to be a lazy match then the question mark after the asterisks make the matches be lazy and they're going to take the smallest amount possible. So we find that there are two matches in this regular expression match on this string. Here we have a regular expression of simply cat and you'll see that it finds cat at the beginning, cat as an individual word, and cat within another word. What we want to do is change that so that it looks only for cat that is the word by itself. We use the boundary tokens to specify that we want it to be 
cat that's in the entire word. And then if we want to find cat at the beginning or cat at the end, we could look for the um, word boundary at the beginning or at the end and then have a non-word boundary either bef after or before the cat. So in this case, this one found cat at the beginning, cat at the beginning, but it did not find the one where it's all uh, just a word by itself, and this one found it where it's at the end. Enumeration is quite simple. In this case, we have our digits plus a period at the end. It's optional. That we're matching four times. So we have one, two, three, four matches. We can also just have three matches if we wanted three of those. And if we want between two and three, it will take a minimum of two and up to three, but not a fourth. The beginning and end of string tokens are very important and helpful too. In this case where we before were finding Clara and Carrie both in the same line, if we wanted to just find the first one, we could say we wanted to find it from the beginning of the, of the string and then it will only find the first instance of it because this one is not at the beginning of the string. The end of string token helps us find things that are only at the end of the string. This cat will find all of the instances of cat, but if we put the end of string token in, it only finds the cat that's at the end of the string. Here are some additional things that are nice about Regex 101. If you need more data space, you can actually change the sizes of the windows. You can also hide or show the quick reference. So if you need more information about the matches, then you can do that. Or if you need more information about the explanation, you can get that. It just depends on what is more important to you, or you can leave both of them. Another thing that you want to be able to do is to possibly save your regex to come back to later, or that you want to share with someone. So you can save it, and then you can copy that um, URL to the clipboard and send it to someone. You can also go ahead and delete these by uh, using this that you copy to the clipboard, put it in your browser, and it will actually delete that regular expression. Otherwise, one thing you want to make sure to do is keep your data cleansed so that no one can use that information to hack into your systems or get access to anything. So please be sure to clean your data before you paste it into Regex 101. Wow, those demos are so good, aren't they? I hope you've all picked up a few things from this session. Some of the main things though I want you to remember about regular expressions are that it might be hard at first, but it gets easier, I promise, and it's definitely worth the effort to learn this. Regular expressions can be used for so many things and not just in Splunk. You can use them for a lot of other things you might be working on and they really improve the functionality, especially when you're doing searches or you're trying to mess with raw data within Splunk. So don't forget, I mentioned that there's a bunch of documentation out there throughout this session. So we have some links to some of the documentation. There's so much more out there than just this. We did also add a link for Regex 101 and a fun little game called Regex Golf. It's super cool. Uh, go check it out to learn some new skills. So thank you so much. Carrie, you want to say goodbye? Yes. Goodbye. Thank you everyone for joining us. And also, if you want to join us in the Regex channel in the Splunk user groups on Slack, you're welcome to join. Great idea. Thanks, Carrie. Have Thanks, a good everyone. rest of B-Sides, everyone.